Good evening and welcome. We might be few in number, but God is with us here. Jesus promised to be with us whenever we're gathered together. Tonight we're looking at Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Now last week we looked at Philippians 1 and we looked at 12 through 26, where Paul talks about his situation with the Philippian church. He tells them what he has been going through. He tells them how the gospel has spread. He tells them that he is confident that whether he lives or dies, God would continue to work with the Philippians and would continue to spread his good news. Now, Paul turns now his attention to the Philippians because not only was he concerned about answering what they wanted to hear, he wanted them to hear a word from him regarding what they were going through. Word had reached Paul that they were having some difficulties. Now, this was, these weren't difficulties as in like the Corinthian church had or even maybe the Thessalonican church. But they still faced some opposition that was coming up. They had troubles of their own. And so Paul tells them that you're going to face opposition. You're in Jesus. You are going to face opposition. And here's some things that you need to remember when you are facing that difficulty. He tells them that in the face of opposition, we have to be united. The church has to be united in living for Jesus. That's what it's all about. And there's three things we see regarding that in this passage. One is that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That's something we have to remember. We're going to, in that facing opposition, evidences, shows that we are actually saved. And then lastly, a little word that we don't like to talk about is the word suffering. But lastly, we'll see that suffering for Christ is part of the Christian life. It's not something that we can avoid. So we are in Philippians chapter 1. And we're looking at verses 27 through 30. Paul writes this. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Well, Paul starts off by addressing the Philippian situation, that they needed to remember that they are citizens of God's kingdom. Paul writes, only conduct yourselves. The word for conduct yourselves there literally means to live as a citizen of. It's the word we get our word politics from. Polis meaning the Greek city. So you represented your city. You represented where you were from. And you did not want to bring shame to your city, to your town. You didn't want that to happen. It was looked down upon. So you wanted people, you wanted to show people that they could be proud of what city you came from. So Paul says here, you need to live as citizens. Citizens of what? Well, Paul later in chapter 3 tells the Philippians that they are citizens of the kingdom of God. They are citizens of heaven. And so we have to live as if we are citizens of heaven. Now, what does that mean to live as a citizen? Well, Paul, oh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about that. He gives in Matthew 5 through 7 the ethics for kingdom living. So if you want to see what living for the kingdom looks like, you can go and see what Jesus has to say about representing God's kingdom here on this earth. The Philippians are in the world, but they were not of the world. And we are the same way. Our home is not here. We may be here right now, but we are merely passing through. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with God. And so we do not need to live at like the rest of the world. We need to live as if God is our king because he is. 
And so that question we have to ask ourselves is, does our lives, do our lives, does my life, does yours, reflect being a citizen of God's kingdom? Can someone look at you and say, something's different about them? Can that be said of you? You see, living for God's kingdom, living as a citizen of God's kingdom, means that we show Jesus to other people. We live as Jesus lived. That is what it's all about. And that's what Paul continues here. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Does the way you live show the good news to other people? Not just with words. Not just saying you believe something, but can they look at your life and see something different that the good news has changed you and transformed you? We talked about that this morning. Have you been changed by the good news and can other people see that in you? So when we face opposition, that's what Paul is addressing here. When we have the world going against us, do we go with the flow? Or do we swim upstream? It might be difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. But we have to conduct ourselves the way Jesus wants us to. We need to live the way Jesus wants us to live. Worthy of the gospel. So do we go forth from this place? Do our lives line up with the good news? Or do we contradict it by living just like the world when we leave these walls? Too many believers have this whole idea, Sunday is the day for church, and I live my life the, rest of the, the way I want to the rest of the week. That's not the way we are to be. We're not Sunday-only Christians. We're 24-7 Christians. That's what this is all about. That's what it means to live for God's kingdom, to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And we don't need... Someone to take our hand and walk us through it. The Philippians didn't need that either. Paul says in continuing in verse 27, So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit. Paul says whether I come again or not. Paul's confident he'll get to visit them again. But Paul's made plans before. And God has said, no, 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 I don't want you going there. I want you to go over here. So Paul's saying, you know, even if I get released, I want to come back to you. My plan is to come back to you. But God might send me somewhere else. And you don't need me to hold your hand to do this. You don't need me to be the training wheels on your bike. You have got this. You can do this, is what he says to the Philippians. And that's the same message for us. See, our faith is not in any person. On, this, on the face of this earth. It's not in a pastor. It's not in a preacher. It's not in a television personality. It's not in scholars. Our trust is in Jesus. And Jesus promised to be with us. And walk us through this life. To strengthen us for whatever it is that we face. Including when we face difficult times. And believe me, we are going to be facing difficult times. The world has always hated Christians. Jesus says, you know what? If they hate you, know that they hated me first. The world does not like us. The world does not like what we teach. We teach that Jesus is the only way to be saved. But that's so exclusive. Surely there's another way. Surely all religions lead to God, lead to heaven. No. Jesus is the only way. We teach that the only true source for authority is God's word. Other people say, well, that's just a man-made book, isn't it? No, it's not. It's God's very own breathed out words to us. We say that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. The world says, oh, but love is love, right? No, it's not. That's not the way of things. We preach that there are consequences for not trusting in Jesus, that there really is a hell. But we don't like to talk about that. Surely God's loving, right? So he wouldn't send people to hell. No, people, because they choose not to trust in Jesus, go there themselves. They already stand condemned before their sins. We have a lot to say that the world does not like to hear. So we will face opposition. If we are living for Jesus, we will face opposition in this world. 
Now, it might, some of it might, sometimes it might not be to our face. It might be behind our backs. But the way this world is going, our country is becoming more and more hostile to Christian teachings. And we're going to face opposition, whether we want it to or not. It might not be this year. It might be not in the next five years. It might be more than a decade away. But soon we'll have to face opposition directly against us. Just as the rest of the Christians in the rest of the world have to face it. They face death every single day. They face imprisonment. They face loss of family, loss of job. They face insecurity of every sort. I saw today that 17 missionaries in Haiti were captured and kidnapped. Christians in Africa are routinely killed by the Fulani herdsmen. In Africa, they, or not in Africa, in Afghanistan, they knocked on doors and opened up and shut believers for simply believing. The world hates Christianity and we will face opposition. And it will be easy to say, I give up, I give in. But Paul tells the Philippians here, continue to live for Jesus. Live as he wants you to live. Do not turn your back on it. You are a citizen of heaven. Live like it. And Jesus is going to be with you. You can do this. And part of that is that we need to have a united front. We don't need to be fighting amongst ourselves. We don't need to be trying to tear each other down. Too often we do that. We try to build our own little kingdoms. There's a lot of ministries out there, a lot of churches, they exist for themselves. They don't exist for God. Even though we're all on the same team, or we're supposed to be. But we are to present a united front. Verse 27 continues. Paul says, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul gets here, he uses military terminology. The Philippians would have understood this. Philippi was a Roman colony city. Its laws, its streets, its buildings, everything was designed to look like a little miniature Rome. The citizens were Roman citizens. They understood this. They got this picture. He tells them that they are to stand firm. This is a picture of a soldier on the front lines not giving ground to attacks from the enemy. Now the thing is, as one soldier by himself cannot hold the line. The Roman, soul, Roman army was strong. It was known for its unity and its strength and its power. And part of that was the way they operated. You would have not just one soldier in the front lines. You would have multiple soldiers in a line together. Shields in front of them, full body shields, locked together. Overlapping one another. And you have another row behind them doing the same thing. Each soldier depended upon the other to keep the line from breaking. That's what we're called to do. We are called to be there for one another, doing our tasks, doing the jobs that God has called us to, to keep the enemy from winning. We are in a war. Paul realized this. We need to recognize this. And we need one another to stand firm. To not give in, to not go with the flow, to not go with the crowd, to not give in to what the world wants. We need to stand firm in one spirit, united together. A church that is divided is not going to accomplish very much for God's mission, for God's purposes. The people of God, if they're not united, nothing is going to be accomplished for God's purposes. Be working against each other. That doesn't solve anything. So if we want to stand against the world, which is what God calls us to, to stand firm where we're at, we need one another. And I can't stress that enough. We are so individualistic in America in the way we think. Because we often think it's about me, what I can do myself. But we got to realize... That in God's kingdom, that's not the way we live. We live needing one another. To encourage one another. To pray for one another. To lift up one another. 
to exhort one another, to correct, to hold each other accountable. We need one another to live for Jesus in this world. If we try to do it by ourselves, we're not going to be able to hold the line. We are going to fall and fail. A church needs to be united and its members need to remember that. Now, Paul shifts metaphors here in this verse as well. He says, with one mind striving together. He switches from a, a military metaphor to something that the Greeks would understand. He switches to a sports metaphor. The striving together comes from two Greek words, soon meaning together and athleo meaning to strive. It's the word from where we get, we get our word athlete from. And this word was used in ancient times to refer to group wrestling events. Not tag team wrestling. This is where you would have multiple people on one team wrestling against multiple people on the other team, all for the goal of winning. Paul loved his sports metaphors. I'm sure on Sunday afternoon, Paul would have probably been in front of the TV watching football. And that's a great picture for what Paul's getting at here. You have a football team against a football team. And each person on the team plays their part. And if they don't play their part, what happens? Bad things happen. If the offensive line doesn't protect the quarterback, what happens to the quarterback? He gets sacked, usually. If the receivers decide they don't want to catch the ball, they just run down the field or they just stop where they're at, what's going to happen? Well, they're not going to catch the ball. You see, every single one of us does a part. We have moved from standing firm to moving forward. Striving together for the faith of the gospel, for the truth, for the trust in the gospel, for what the gospel contains. We talked about the gospel this morning. It is the primary thing we need to remember. And it's what we are all together to do. Not everybody is a gifted evangelist. Not everybody can go door to door and knock on a door. Not everybody can sing God's praises beautifully. Not everybody can really open up their home to welcome others. Paul talks about this a lot in his letters. And he says, you know, we've all been gifted differently, but we're all members of one body. Just like the toe is not a finger. And the foot's not an eye. We all still play a role in serving God. And building up the church and reaching other people. We have to strive together to do this. We have to be on the same team. Once again, unity is a big deal. Big deal. That's part of the reason Paul wrote this letter. This very personal letter to this church. A church he cared for so very much. He didn't want them to succumb to the world. He didn't want them to, to fall away from what they should have been doing. And he says the key thing to do this is to live in harmony with one another, to be united together. A united church is a powerful force for God's good, for God's mission, for advancing the kingdom. But a divided church is not going to get anywhere. So we're to present a united front against the world when it attacks. But in all of this, we need to remember that our struggle is not with the people out there. The people out there are not our chief problem. They're not our chief enemy. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against spiritual powers. And the only offensive weapon we're given in that list of armor from Ephesians 6 is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're not to go about bashing people over the head. We're not to go about targeting other people. We're not to treat them as the enemy because they are mere pawns in the hands of the true enemy. They are slaves to sin. They are in bondage to the devil. Our enemy is not the people. And our weapon against them is not against them. Our weapon is the word of God. And what are we advancing? What are we preaching? We preach the good news of Jesus. Because what we want is we want them to stop being enemies and to become part of our family. Become part of God's kingdom. That's what it's about. We're not trying to tear them down, make them look bad. We want them to see Jesus. 
and see something and want what we have. They may be the enemy, but they're not our enemy. They may kill us, but they're still not our enemy. And what did Jesus say? Even then, if they were our enemy, we are to love our enemies. How well do we do with that? I know I struggle with it. Especially in these days, most of our interactions, a lot of interactions take place online, not face to face. It's easy to lose sight that the other person out there is a real person. But they're not our enemy. And so we need to respond and speak truth in love. Paul continues in verse 28. And this, he tells us here that we're not to be, un, to be alarmed by opposition. He says, in no way alarmed by your opponents. We should be caught off guard because of this. The word for alarmed here is, is like a skittish horse. That, that shies and rears at the slightest thing. It's, it's a scared, scaredy horse. That's not the way we are to be. When we're attacked, we shouldn't be surprised. Remember what we said? If they hate, you know that they hated me first, Jesus said. This opposition to the gospel, to the good news, to the advance of God's kingdom should come as no surprise because we do have an enemy. Peter in 1 Peter 13, uh, 3 verses 15 through 16 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Peter was saying, hey, they might be lying about you, they might be slandering you. You keep on living the good life so that everybody knows that they're lying. So that nothing will stick to you. How are we doing in that way? Is there enough evidence to convict us of being Christian? Or do we look like the world? Maybe their accusations are true. Maybe we're not acting like Christians. Too often that's the case too. We are human after all. We do sin. We do mess up. But where are we at when it comes to this? And are we ready to explain what Jesus has done for us when people ask, what's going on in your life? How are you this way? Why are you so different? Why are you acting the way you do? Are we ready to say, well, it's Jesus? And explain what that means? We're not to be alarmed. We are instead to be ready. Now, the second area here is facing opposition. When this happens, it serves as a twofold sign. Verse 28 still. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. You see, when opponents attack us for believing in Jesus, for living for Jesus, that's a sign that they are not on God's side. And that they are bound and doomed for destruction. Just as Satan is bound and doomed for destruction. That's their lot too. When the world attacks us, we have to remember that the world is against God. And if it's against God, it's against us. That's all there is to it. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and so we automatically have a target on our backs. That's the way of it. This is a sign, it says, not for, of destruction for them, but salvation for you. When the world attacks you for being a Christian, for following after Jesus... That's a sign you are on God's side, that you, that God is with you, that the world hates you. If you were not on God's side, the world wouldn't be attacking you. You're on God's side. That's amazing. That's good news. So Paul says, in the midst of all this persecution, in the midst of opposition that comes up, you got to remember, you're on God's side. No matter what they throw at you, they can't separate you from the love of God. Paul talks about that over in Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's good news. Even in the midst of persecution. In the midst of opposition. And this sign is from God. Now we don't like to think about hard things coming from God, do we? 
We don't like to talk about suffering, our pain, our problems. A lot of times we want to keep it to ourselves and put on a face and just do a show. We don't want others burden. We don't want to burden others a lot of times. But suffering is part of the Christian life. Not just suffering in general, though. Because sometimes a lot of the suffering that we endure, we bring upon ourselves through our own decisions, our stupid actions. Sometimes we just don't get along with other people because our personalities are in conflict. It happens. That's not the suffering that Paul is talking about here. Look in verse 29 and 34. To you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Suffering for Jesus is a gift. Now that doesn't sound right, does it? That doesn't sound right. Why in the world would suffering for Jesus be a gift? It's hard to understand. And I don't claim to understand at all. And I'm not going to tell you I do. But I know that Peter says this in 1 Peter 4. He says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. When we suffer for Christ, everything else is stripped away. We are, we can only trust in Jesus when that happens. When everything else is gone from us, when our friends and family has deserted us, when we have no source of income, when the world is threatening to kill us and Satan's breathing down our neck, we can only trust in Jesus. That's all we're left with. And maybe that's the gift. All the distractions are removed. And there's only him to trust and obey. Paul's an example of this. Paul endured great hardship for Jesus. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, I'm not going to read that one, but he suffered greatly. Shipwrecks, distresses, colds, everything you can think of, being stoned, being beaten, lied about. He faced all sorts of opposition. But he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we remove everything that distracts us, or when God removes everything that distracts us so that we can only focus on Jesus, He performs great works that way. When we get out of God's way, God does amazing things. So what's holding back in your life? Are we getting in God's way? Or is God working a mighty work? Maybe that we can't even see yet. Half the time we don't see it. It's further down the road. But when our opposition comes upon us, when we face persecution for what we believe, and right now it's not that much in our country, Maybe by the media, maybe by the elites on the coast, maybe by some hoity-toity bigwigs somewhere. Right now, it's not too bad for us. But when it does come, when the mocking comes, the derision, the bad jokes, the insults, all of those things, you know what our response should be? It's to take joy in it. Joy is not about our circumstance. That's happiness. Joy is about an attitude of seeing what God is doing, no matter the situation, no matter how dark life can get. We are to respond with joy. In Acts chapter 5, Peter understood this. It says, after they were arrested and scourged and beaten, it says, they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Are you ready for that? I'm not sure I am, to be honest. And we'll never be able to say for sure until we actually go through it. There have been Christians who seem strong, but when persecution hits, they turn tail and run. They don't hold the line. And yet there are Christians who it seems like they were some of the weaker ones, and yet God does something mighty through them, and they stay faithful. 
So how are we going to respond when opposition comes? The church needs to be united, offering a united front. We need to remember that we're citizens of God's kingdom, not of this world. This world is like this, gone in a flash. But eternity with God is forever. So what happens to us here shouldn't surprise us. The world hates us. It shouldn't discourage us because it's going to be over and just like this, just like a flash. For when you compare to all eternity. And we need to remember that suffering for Christ is part of what he has called us to. Health and wealth preachers like to say, no, no, God's got great things planned for you. Oh, he does. But sometimes it might not be in this life. God's not about your prosperity. He is concerned with your holiness. That's something we need to remember. Sometimes he lets us go through things to draw us closer to him. So how are you going to stand? Let's pray. Almighty God, we are so thankful for your love, Lord, in your grace towards us. Lord, we don't, we don't have it bad right now here. But we know the world hates us and that Satan has targeted us. But we know that you are with us and that you are able to strengthen us to endure. Remind us that we live for you and not for this world. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters around this world who are suffering for your name. Those 17 missionaries in Haiti, Lord, we lift them up to you. And Lord, we pray. We pray that you would just work a miracle and free them, Lord. That they might be able to share their testimony, that they might be able to share their gospel, the gospel of your grace and goodness even more, Lord. Bless them. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters who are in other countries who are facing death for simply trusting in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would give them the strength to endure. And we know that it might not be in your will to release them and free them and deliver them from their situation, the way that we think of, Lord. But we pray that they would not malign your name, that they would instead have a boldness that comes only from you. Lord, we lift these prayers up. We lift these people up to you, your children. Lord, help us to remember them in our prayers. Help us to live boldly as they have lived boldly. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing love. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.